Mark chapter 15, verse 33. Now at noon, darkness came over the whole land. No, that's the wrong bit. Sorry, verse 42. It was preparation day. That is the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, placed it in a tomb, cut out of rock, and he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Sorry, I missed out the bit that he took down the body and wrapped it in a cloth. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, They saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter. He is going ahead of you into Galilee, and there you will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Wonderful. Well, good morning. It's um, lovely to see your smiling faces uh, this morning. If, if we haven't yet met, uh, my name is James, and um, we're going to be looking at these words together. So don't shut your Bibles. Do keep them open um, in front of you. Now, uh, I'm married to Sarah, but when we first met and we're first dating, courting, I had no idea what I was doing. So um, like all good men, all good former engineers, I bought a book because I thought it would tell me what to do. And um, it had all sorts of great questions to ask, all great things to do. One of which was to have a picnic in a graveyard. Um, And uh, I decided that probably wasn't the best idea, uh, thinking that that maybe if, if I did that, that could be the swift end of a relationship. Anyway, a couple of years later, I was telling Sarah this story, and she said, I would have loved that. That would have been great. As a former forensic scientist and nurse, she loved reading the stories of different people's lives on, on, on graves. And, and, and she was right to her word. When I was a curate in Cornwall, we had a big graveyard, and Sarah was often found walking around, looking and reading the stories of, of people. For me, going around that graveyard was, was filled with mixture of feelings, because often the people whose names she was reading were people I knew who I'd buried. A picnic in a graveyard, maybe not, but a graveyard confronted with a mixture of feelings. Um, In the face of death, I I wonder what we feel. It may be a case of wanting, like me in a graveyard, to run away from it. It may be that we we kind of uh, cling to anything and anything we could get hold of. We desperately want some form of hope. You know, as as a young person, I thought, well, 
I don't need to worry about death. I'm a, I'm a, it's, it's miles away. Young people today, I don't know if that resonates. You know, I've got at least another 400 years until I get old. So uh, I don't even need to think about it. We just push it to the back of my mind. But yet, having got older and meeting older people, is that still something we do? We just kind of run away from it. We push it. We, we don't really think about it. I said, every time I go and do a funeral, I don't think there's very many people that run away from it. I've met two funerals in the midst of hundreds where the minister's gone and they started as ashes and now they're ashes, that's it. Really? Everybody longs for something, whether it's the the poems that they've said of, of just slipping away into another room or untying their boat and having drifted off down the river. Whether it's the, the platitude said of great aunt Matilda, she's looking down on us now. Everyone longs, wants to cling for something, for hope, faith in the midst of death. And that's for both a Christian and a non-Christian. Everyone longs for something. I wonder what, what you find yourself doing, when, perhaps when you, you hear of things, when you lose someone that you love, or, or you're confronted with something that shows you your own mortality. I've watched two ladies in our church family who've, who've faced the diagnosis and reality of cancer. Tears have come, anguish has followed, but I've watched as like a flower they've flourished in their faith. They've not run away, but have held more tightly to Jesus. And it's caused them to follow him even more. And those ladies have grasped something of the truth that we're going to see in these last few verses of Mark. These last few verses that that show us how awesome Jesus is. Now, if you happen to remember when we started this series in Mark, back in January, we had a a, a few A's up the front here of how people see Jesus. Some people see him as awful on this side, you know, waste of time, rubbish. Some people see him as average, oh, he's a bloke. And some people see him as awesome. Well, Mark wants to crown it off by helping us see he isn't, a, he isn't average and he's definitely not awful because of what he does in a graveyard that is life-changing and awesome. That's the thing we need to see today, that we need to be amazed by this awesome Jesus. But you'd be forgiven for thinking, as, we, as uh, Barbara read it to us, that awesome and amazement is, is the furthest thing from what's going on here, isn't it? You know, um, verse uh, 5, they were alarmed... They're alarmed at what's going on. And in the first half, there's great sadness at the funeral of Jesus. Amazed? Awesome? Really? Well, these verses are going to be so important to us that Paul, a writer in the New Testament a little bit later, is going to say that on this truth, the whole Christian faith stands or sinks. Like a deck of cards, if this isn't true, the whole thing falls down. We might as well go and believe something else. We might as well all go home and meet somewhere else. Because these truths speak of Jesus dead and Jesus risen. So let's come and see. Here's the first part. Jesus is really, really dead. Now that may seem a really stupid thing to say, isn't it? But Mark wants us to know that he's really, really dead. You know, we, if you remember last week, we saw that Jesus has been on the cross, that, that he's died, and now Joseph has come to give him a funeral. But as he comes to give him a funeral, he goes and asks Pilate, can he, can he go and bury him? And Pilate's a bit flummoxed, verse 44. How, how is this man who, who just has gone to the cross at midday, if you remember, how can he already be dead by that evening? Crucifixion is, is horrendous. It takes hours for someone to die. If you remember last week, Jesus gives up his life. He he dies at three in the afternoon. And so what does Pilate do to prove whether he is or isn't alive? He summons the man in charge of him. The centurion, verse 44. Do you remember the centurion last week? The man who who orchestrated every mocking gesture, every every horrible word, every uh, brutal blow was given at the command of the centurion. And then as he stood and watched as Jesus died, with tears in his eyes, he says, surely this man is the son of God. Imagine him coming before Pilate, realizing it was me that killed him, having to say, yeah, he really was dead. Really dead. 
And so once Pilate has that, Joseph is allowed to go and bury him. Joseph goes and gives him a, a funeral in a large tomb. And it goes and puts him inside and then places a rock that, that's twice the size of me in front of this tomb. A, a rock designed to be shut and never opened. You see the point? Jesus is really, really dead. And one of the hardest things I've ever had to do is stand with a family as they had to identify a loved one and say, yeah, that's my family member who's died. Well, I don't want to rub this in our faces. Well, what he wants us to know is that Jesus is dead as he said he would be. He, he's not faking it. He didn't have a stunt double. He, he didn't suddenly have a secret ladder that was behind the cross that means he could jump off, get down and put somebody else up there as, as Muslims or Jehovah's Witnesses would have you believe. This is not some super duper magic trick. Jesus is really, really dead. But we need to remember that that's not the end of the story. Because although he told us this would happen, he told us and his disciples the next thing. That Jesus is really risen, as he promised. Now, as we come into chapter 16, these three ladies have gone off to, uh, um, to give him, uh, to honor him, to give him some last, last final act of worship, to anoint him. And as they're pottering on their way uh, to the, the, uh, um, the tomb, wondering who's going to open it, they open their eyes, don't they? Verse 4, they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away. That's terrifying. How did that move? It shouldn't have moved. It's even more terrifying when they go in and see, one, not Jesus, and two, someone else sat there. Hello. <laughs> and he says to them, don't be alarmed. I think they have every cause for being alarmed, by the way. <laughs> totally alarmed. Don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, verse 6, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Look at the place where they laid him. This Jesus is gone. He's alive. He's alive. But look, look what he says in verse 7. But go tell his disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Just as he told you. Now if you're a parent here or work with children or grandparent or you've just done anything with children or you can remember being a child, I wonder how many times your parents or you had to ask them to do something. Uh, please could you tidy up after yourself? Please could you tidy up after you do yourself? Please could you tidy up after you do yourself? If you don't tidy up after you do yourself, there is now going to be a consequence. Please tidy up after you do yourself. You know, if parenting and goes with it, looking after children, is delivering on your promises, isn't it? Of saying something once, saying something twice, as many times as it takes for people to realize. And Jesus had done just the same with the disciples. He'd already told them three times, Chapter 8, verse 31, that he, he must be killed and after three days rise again. Chapter 9, verse 31, that, he will kill, that they will kill him and after three days he'll rise. And chapter 10, verse 33, they'll mock him, spit on him, flog him and kill him and three days later he'll rise. I'm going to rise, I'm going to rise, I'm going to rise. It shouldn't have been news to the disciples. This is what he said he was going to do. And now it's happened just as he told you just as he promised why does that matter well who does this kind of thing whoever has beaten death uh nobody nobody's beaten death so we really need to know that this is what he planned that this wasn't some accident he was really dead and now he's really alive he's really risen from the dead Jesus is all about keeping his promises, keeping God's promises. And not just the promises that he spoke, but the promises of the Old Testament. Like in Genesis 22, where Isaac is, is saved 1,500 years before Jesus was born. And the book of Hebrews says it's like Isaac has been resurrected from the dead. Or in Psalm 22, that speaks of God's Holy One not seeing decay a thousand years before Jesus was born. Or Hosea 6, 800 years before Jesus was born. Or Isaiah 53, that God's precious one will not die in 700 years before Jesus was born. Or Jonah, remember him? He gets swallowed in a fish and in Matthew's Gospel it said that's going to happen to Jesus. Written 500 years before he was born. Do you see the point? 
God has always been promising that he is going to send someone who is going to beat death. It should be no surprise. But why is that important? Well, if you and I are going to trust this Jesus, we need to know that what he says is true. That what he says is going to happen. He's died, tick. He's risen, tick. When he says that he's come to forgive our sins, tick. When he says he's come to bring us into a relationship with his Father, tick. When he says that he's come to give us a a world, a heaven, a new creation that will be perfect and no longer broken, tick. We can trust what Jesus says. Because as we see unbelievable things, we need to know they're believable because he promised and he delivered. That's the wonderful news of Jesus' resurrection. But it's even more wonderful news because as well as being for everyone, here's the third thing, it's for everyone including Peter's. Including Peter's. Now, um, I don't know if anyone does this to you, but if they say, it's lovely to see you, church family, and Harry. Um, I hope you're all feeling well, church family, including you, Harry. You know, because you're a great bunch, including you, Harry. You know, Harry would start to feel slightly like, What's, what, what have I done? It happens in our house. As Sarah's asked one of the kids to go and tell everybody it's dinner time, tea time. Uh, you know, could you go and tell everybody it's tea time, including Dad? That's because she knows that I'll be music on, working away, and I've totally lost track of time. You want to make a point of, of giving it to, to them, to Harry. And Jesus does it, or sorry, the man in the tomb does exactly this. Look, look at verse 7. But go and tell his disciples, which includes Peter, and Peter. We think, what's Peter done? Has he been on the naughty step? Is he in trouble? Is he the one likely to forget? Would well, you remember the story of Peter? Chapter 8, he gets it. Jesus, you're the Messiah, you're the one come to fix the world. And Jesus says, yes, that's right, and I'm going to die on a cross. And he says, no, you're not. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. In that one full move, Peter becomes public enemy number one, even greater than Satan. He then tries hard, doesn't he, through the rest of the book, as he he says, look, Jesus, I'll follow you come what may. Whatever happens, I will not leave you. And then as the cock crows for the third time and Peter realizes he's denied Jesus three times, he realizes he's public enemy number one. He didn't want what Jesus wanted, and he turned away from Jesus. So imagine how precious these words are now, that he'd come and tell his disciples, and Peter, you're, you're welcome. Even Peter's are welcome. Even people who don't want, didn't think I needed to die, even people who, who deny me are welcome. He's going to come and see them. He's risen from the dead for you. Isn't that wonderful news? If we have been a Peter, not thinking we needed Jesus to die for us, not really wanting him in our life. If we've been a Christian for many years and we look back and we see those moments where, yes, we've denied Jesus by our actions, our thoughts and our words, we're still welcome to come and see him. The promises he gives us can still be ours even when we're Peter's. That's why the gospel, this good news of Jesus, is is for everybody. Anyone from any background who's done anything can come and know the wondrous truth of this Jesus. Are you amazed by him yet? Hopefully you've seen he's not definitely not awful. And hopefully you've seen he's better than average. This Jesus who's beaten death just as he promised. That means that you and I don't need to be frightened of death. Frightened when the doctor looks over the table and says it's not good news. Frightened when we lose someone that we love. We don't need to fear and run away. But we can hold tight to Jesus. Imagine what that might mean for us as a church. A group of bold and confident people. Not in themselves but in the truth that Jesus has beaten death. Who are able to, when when one of us is alarmed or frightened by all that's going on, can help give them confidence, even through tears. 
A church that's bold in sharing Jesus with the world, even though the world doesn't want to know it, because they know it's the only answer to a world that seems set on breaking itself and falling over with all that seems to be to solve it of NHS and education and politicians not seemingly working, but a gospel message that does work. Imagine what that might mean for you and for I, that we might be able to have confidence and joy in the midst of life, even in the midst of pain and tears. Of living not for our comfort and well-being here, but, but living for eternity knowing that one day we'll be with Jesus, with no more pain, no more suffering. We're seeking to pass that good news on to our children, on to others, seeing it as our, a desperate need, confident that he did as he promised. He beat death, and he did it for everyone, including Peter's. Peter's like you, me, and the world out there. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, as we look at this whole book that you've been teaching us, have you shown us again and again how awesome Jesus is? We thank you that we we come not by our brilliance, but we come to receive it simply by saying, I'm sorry, and I trust Jesus. Help us today to do that for the first time or the millionth time. To know the confidence and joy it is. To know that Jesus who really died is really risen just as he promised. So that all his promises could be ours. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.